I'm Pret, and this is my wife Megan, and uh, we're here to share our story. And I'm going to start by sharing my story. Uh, it might be similar to other stories. It might parallel or be uh, compared to others, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is to share my experiences. Um, let's see. I first realized I dealt with same-sex attraction. I didn't call it that then, but I knew that I had these feelings when I was about five years old. Um, I remember being a little more curious about boys and girls, and I remember, uh, I remember having a lot of questions and not knowing where to get those questions answered, and there was a lot of confusion that resulted, and I remember trying to ask my parents or trying to figure some of this out, but it never really worked. Um, that was the first time I remember questioning some of these things. As life went on, by about age you know, 11, 12, we'd moved out to Utah, um, and it kind of got worse. The questions got a little bit deeper, um, and it became a little more confusing, especially around puberty and um, turning junior high and uh, at that time in life was confusing and difficult and um, it was just, uh, as I look back on it, I'd probably say it was almost traumatic. Um, that's a little bit dramatic to say, but that's how it felt. I remember first moving out here and just being so alone. I remember seeing kids grouped together playing basketball and having fun and I tried the basketball thing and that just was uncomfortable with my own coordination and um, lacking confidence and not being very comfortable and I remember many times sitting at the lunch table um, <laughs> I remember sitting there and just being so afraid so afraid to be me so afraid that I was going to be rejected I remember sitting there a couple of times and my chin would start to quibble and I was so afraid that somebody would notice and a few times I almost broke into tears. I was so alone and I didn't know how to ask for help. I didn't know how to find friends or make friends and so a lot of these feelings really became cemented at that point. I distinctly remember a couple of people that I started to uh, be attracted towards and I wanted their attention and their affection and um, I just didn't didn't know how to get it didn't know how to be uh, a person around them thankfully high school got a lot better I I dealt with these feelings and I just stuffed them I bottled them all up I knew they were there I was very aware of my attractions towards other guys I knew that um, they weren't going away I thought that if I just kept praying and reading my scriptures that they would. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, so I'd read more and pray more and that still didn't work. Uh, but what did work was I gained a testimony and I learned about the gospel and I gained a, a real foundation of faith. And uh, as time went on, seminary was great and I formed a great group of friends that were just phenomenal. To this day, I. I really love and appreciate them. They're still really close to me, and I'm grateful, and I I will be forever grateful for a couple of them, um, no doubt about it. So all the meanwhile, these feelings just stayed under the surface quite a ways under. I was scared to death of letting anybody find out. I was scared that my parents would find out. I was scared that my friends would find out, and so I hid them. I kept them all secret. and. I had a lot of shame. I didn't even know what the word shame meant back then, but I had all kinds of shame about these feelings, and I made certain that they would never be revealed to anybody, um, even to the point where I'd overcompensate for some of my fears and whatnot. Um, anyway, I knew that I needed to go on a mission. I knew that uh, I wanted to. I, I had a testimony of the gospel, and I believed that that's, that's what I needed to do, to follow the prophet. and. So I submitted my papers and I went confidently and faithfully and I made a promise to God that if he would uh, heal me or fix me rather, 
that I would serve faithfully and that I would do my best. And I, I went out there believing wholeheartedly that when I came home, or when I would come home, that these would be all taken care of. And so I worked my butt off. Um, a lot of missionaries work really hard to get a really hot, you know, wife. I was just working hard to want a wife, <laughs> uh, and that would have been enough for me. Um, and uh, my mission was exceptional. I formed some really good friendships there. I had some phenomenal experiences. I met some of the neatest people on the face of this earth. I served in the Czech Republic, and I had just amazing experiences, both with other missionaries as well as teaching the gospel there. And on my mission, SSA was an issue. It did come up, but it wasn't it wasn't as intense. It was like uh, similar to high school. High school was fun and I had all these friends and I had support. Um, and the same thing on my mission. It was there, but it was under the surface. Even for me, it wasn't a forefront issue simply because as I look back, I realized I was getting my needs met. I was interacting with the other missionaries. I was having a blast. I was laughing. I was crying. I was integrated in, in the work of being a missionary and serving the people and loving them. And that was my priority. I was serving a higher purpose. And in so doing, this fell down on the ranks. And I'm grateful for that because I was able to fully commit myself to the work. And I loved it. I loved being a missionary. And especially knowing that when I got home, this would all be gone. <laughs> So, uh, to my dismay, as I got home, um, I remember distinctly thinking about a week before I was about to leave. I'm like, okay, so any minute now, it's just going to change. Maybe it's the bus ride to the mission house and it'll, you know, go away. Or maybe it's the airplane ride home and that'll take care of it. Once I just land back in Salt Lake, it'll be gone. And, you know, minor disappointment here, minor disappointment there. It wasn't gone. I thought maybe it's the... The homecoming talk. After that, it'll go away. And did a really good homecoming talk. Bore my testimony in check, and it still didn't go away. Um, I thought maybe it just takes another week or two before he kicks this full blessing in, and it didn't go away. And I remember distinctly one moment. Uh, my whole family was gone. I was, you know, I was come home from the mission. Everybody has their own priorities. They're integrated into their own schoolwork. Their own work their own lives and yet the missionary is trying to figure out what his life is and in that flux I had a lot of free time for the first couple of weeks and I distinctly remember thinking once everybody's gone I'm gonna go up to the living room where I've had other spiritual experiences in family prayer reading the scriptures and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna finally get the answer and I distinctly remember getting on my knees and I prayed and I said God I've done my part I've served I've been faithful. I'm ready. Take it away. And I waited, and I waited, and I thought, oh, I'm not feeling anything. Um, I'm not feeling the feelings gone, but I felt peace. And I remember distinctly thinking, no, that's not what I'm supposed to feel. I'm supposed to feel these things gone, um, but I felt peace. And I was confused by that, and yet I was um, comforted. And so I thought, okay, well maybe, who knows? Maybe it's just gonna go away in time, I, I don't know. Maybe if I go outside, and walk down the street, I'll figure out it's gone as I see an attractive neighbor or two that are no longer attractive. And so I go outside, I, I took a walk, and they weren't gone. <laughs> um, but I still felt peace. Um, as time went on, I got into school, I got fully engrossed in my studies, I uh, got a job, I was working full time and I was going to school full time and really committed myself to moving on with my life regardless of whether or not this had you know, been taken away, it, I have to move on, that's just life. Um, as, as dating became a bigger issue, as it became a priority and people would ask, these feelings would become that much more uncomfortable. There were a couple of different girls I dated. Um, one in particular that I was really attracted to that I thought, I just need to marry the really hot one and this will all be okay. And that didn't work. She didn't end up liking me like I liked her. And there's another girl I dated and thought, maybe I just need to be the man and just be really powerful and tough and that'll fix it. And that didn't fix it. She didn't end up liking me. and I. 
I was confused thinking, what is God doing? Like, this is supposed to be taken away. So in dating these different women, um, I remember distinctly thinking if I just, if I find the girl that will elicit that response from me, that will bring me into the type of man that I judge other men to be around them, then, then I'll arrive, then it'll all be okay. And so I looked for that girl and I kept looking and it never worked out. I kept being not enough for her or it just wasn't the right situation. There was one girl in particular I was thinking of just earlier today um, as I was thinking about some of my story and how life was. She was a little couple of years younger than me. She was very, very beautiful. Um, and I remember thinking I just, I need to pull up in my truck and impress her and help her into the truck and take her out on a wild date and show her a good time and be that man. And uh, I did my best and <laughs> she didn't return my phone calls after a few dates. And so it just didn't seem to work out the way it was supposed to. Um, and that was not okay with me. As time went on, it became more and more uncomfortable as people were uh, asking, so how's the dating life going? And you've been home now a year and you're not married, something's wrong with you, which is a bunch of crap. Uh, nonetheless, I bought into that because um, yeah, the peer pressure, because it's Utah, because it's, you know, that's what Mormons do. That's what LDS men do. They come home from the mission and they get married. And all growing up, that was my biggest fear that I wouldn't be able to get married. I remember being 17 years old. I was a lifeguard working at a pool and we had uh, a teacher of ours that actually came and worked at the pool with us as a manager and she was very cool she was lots of fun to joke with and she was a this teacher of ours was a math teacher and so we all knew her it was a bunch of us from high school and I distinctly remember when she got engaged and came and showed off this big rock and she was so excited to show all of her students that she's now ready for marriage and I distinctly remember one of my buddies came up and started to tease her about her wedding night and I thought, that's kind of weird, what do you mean? Like, wedding night, what's the big deal about that? And he kept teasing her and she was getting all red and embarrassed. And then he finally brought out the S word, sex. And she, you know, started laughing and everybody around me started laughing. And I wasn't laughing because I realized, wait, if I get married, I'm gonna have to have sex with a woman. And I remember just being scared to death of that. I remember thinking, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I would enjoy that. I don't know if I'm capable of that. And it was very uncomfortable. It was, everybody else was laughing. Everybody got a kick out of it, including my teacher, who was awesome, except for me, because this huge fear washed over me. And I'll never forget that moment. I think I went home that day and I cried. And I thought, that'll never be mine. I'll never have a chance to be married. I'll never have a chance to be a father not with what I felt at that time. So as I come home from the mission and I'm trying to date and make this work and every girl I date by the first or second date, I'm questioning whether or not, you know, not only can we get married, but am I gonna be able to have sex with her? Um, and that's just not fair as I look back and look at the pressure I was putting on myself. Um, it was horribly unfair. And the pressure I would then put on the relationship um, unfair to the women I dated and unfair to myself most of all. Um, so as time went on, uh, I took on a lot of classes at school to busy my time and busy my mind. I was working full time and uh, life got really hard. It didn't get easier. I got a lot of schoolwork done and uh, I made a lot of money, but I was hiding and I was trying to cover up my emotions because I was too afraid of feeling them. Um, I was too afraid of confronting my fear around my same-sex attraction. And as time went on in this phase, I, I, there's no way I could keep up with what was happening. Um, I was starting to deteriorate spiritually and I was starting to decline and my hope was fading and anger started to bud and grow within me that God didn't take this away that it's still an issue. And I started to doubt that I could ever have what I've always wanted. And um, it really ticked me off. I thought, this is not fair. This isn't what I signed up for. Um, 
And I got really depressed and I got angry and I went through the motions of life, but I was not living. Um, I was barely accomplishing even. So it only became harder. I was finally in a class and finally uh, uh, not having ever acted out or done anything wrong um, in terms of you know, uh, behavior with another guy, though always wanting that, starving for that, really. Um, I finally met somebody in one of my science classes. And the second, once I, you know, came to realize that he also dealt with this, my spirit broke in half. And uh, I'll never forget that moment. All my hope, it's like, it's like, Time stood still and somebody dropped a, a glass of water and it just shattered on the floor. And that's how I felt emotionally, that's how I felt spiritually. I knew I couldn't keep up my behavior, my good behavior. I knew that things would come to a head. And I didn't know how and I didn't know what was going to happen. But I knew that I couldn't continue on. I didn't want to be a miserable Mormon. I didn't want to be a liar. Um, and I didn't want to kill myself, and yet those seemed to be the only options. And I was totally overwhelmed. I, I distinctly remember going on a, a family vacation, and my mom said to me, Pratt, what's wrong? You've lost weight, you're not eating, you're not the same person. And I remember going back to the truck, <laughs> and uh, I was, I was, we were whitewater rafting. You're supposed to have fun when you whitewater raft. And I remember going and sitting in the truck, all by myself and I just cried because I felt the impact of all of this at once and uh, I thought I'm done I don't want this this isn't the life I don't want to be gay I don't want to lie I don't want to continue to hide all of this and I didn't know of any other options and I just sat there and I just cried and I hid it um, People would walk by the truck and I'd wipe the tears away and um, I did the best I could to conceal it and it was horrible. The rest of the trip went on and I got through it like I always did, you know, put up a tough chin and take it, you know, as, as the punches get thrown, uh, which is exactly what I did as a kid. I put on a nice happy face, my people pleaser, and let everybody know that it's going to be okay and, and it will be. Um, but it wasn't. It got worse. I ended up uh, doing, making some big mistakes with this individual. And uh, I call them mistakes because it's, it's the fall I needed to find the help. Um, it was horrible. It was life-changing for me. Um, I finally got to that point where the pain of what I was experiencing was greater than the pain of having to change. And it's, it, I'll never forget that day. I, I, uh, I went to work as everything was normal, but I, I couldn't go on as normal. I went into the bathroom and started dry heaving. I was so sick and distraught with my behavior, with who I knew I was becoming. And so I went immediately to my boss and said, I gotta go home. <laughs> I'm sick. And he's like, yeah, you've been sick for like a month. We know you're not the normal prep that we know. And so uh, I went out to my truck. I was just bawling. I called my mom and I said, mom, we got to talk. Um, I need you to have an open heart and an open mind. And uh, she knew that something was wrong, but she had no idea what. And she was prepared. And uh, I just... I, I, I reacted to how devastated I was inside. I wasn't even thinking as much as I just, it was survival. And I drove home and <laughs> uh, she was standing at the door and she flung it open waiting for me to come up out of my truck and uh, she just put her arms around me and said, it doesn't matter what it is, I love you and I'm here for you. And I just, I couldn't even walk hardly. She helped me get to a seat and I, I didn't even make it there all the way. And she wasn't strong enough to keep me up. I sat right there on the ground and just bawled and said, mom, I'm gay. And I, I don't know what to do about it. And 
she was amazing. There was terror for about 13 seconds that shot across her face. And after her own wits came about, it was, there's answers, we're gonna find help. I don't know anything about this, but we're gonna do whatever it takes. And I just sat there and cried and I just let it all out. And she listened. I didn't even, I don't even remember exactly what I said. It was just horrible and yet freeing. And it started and uh, <laughs> she said, well, you're, you're gonna tell your dad, right? <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on it, but you're in charge now. I've kind of given up the steering wheel. And uh, so we waited, he came home. I cried for about four hours with my mom. We said a prayer. Uh, she was remarkable. You know, the classic mother, if we are gonna compare stories to others, she was just awesome. Um, my dad came home. He was a little less than awesome. Uh, he's become remarkable. But in that moment, he was scared. I'm his son, and he didn't know what to say. He didn't have the best comforting words. He was a, you know, a bishop my whole life, or a branch president, a district president, stake president. Um, excuse me. He, uh, he did give me a blessing though and he did love me and he prayed for me and he was there he gave up his meetings and all his other priorities that day and he just sat there with us and we talked and it was the most freeing conversation I've ever had I'll never forget how exposed I felt um, and it wasn't comfortable to be exposed I don't want to be misunderstood it, it it's it sucked okay yet it was different so I remember a week after I told him, it was exactly a week, one of my buddies from my old swim team called and invited me to go on this man's camp. I thought, perfect, <laughs> this is what I need to be a man. Uh, and I didn't have, my truck was, I had to get the clutch fixed, it worn down, and so I had to borrow my dad's truck. And I'd always been so afraid to ruin this thing. I mean, this is my dad's vehicle, this is top notch priority. We don't hurt it, we take care of it. And this time it was different. I remember taking it up into the mountains, putting it in four-wheel drive, and we got that son of a gun stuck. And normally I would be so afraid to irritate him or to tick him off or to, to do anything outside of what he thought was best. But it was different now. I thought he knows about my, you know, my homosexual feelings, my SSA. Who cares about the truck? <laughs> and that was different. I, I'll, I'll never forget that moment of you just got his truck stuck, you're screwed, Pret. And then the reassuring thought of he knows everything, he didn't reject you for that, you can get away with murder. <laughs> um, and it was great because I felt free around him, which was different. Um, and life started to change. I finally heard about Evergreen. My mom immediately did a ton of work and found out all, all this different research and stuff. And uh, it, it ended up being awesome. I went to this conference, I met tons of people. Uh, it was a remarkable experience. It was everything I could to get there. I was really afraid. I didn't want to go. I just knew I needed to. I remember sitting in my car listening to Czech music to feel comfort and peace and I was shaking. I was so afraid. I, I barely could walk through the doors and I remember I'll never forget two moments at this conference. I walked in, I sat down, and my eyes were closed. I was so afraid to look at other people. I was so afraid to be seen. And just like a little two-year-old playing hide-and-go-seek, you say, time to hide, and they close their eyes. That's how I felt. I wanted to hide. I just wanted to close my eyes and let it all go away. But I remember sitting down, forcing my eyes open, and then looking around and seeing hundreds of people. And the relief and some of them were married, some of them had girls you know, next to them, some of them didn't, some of them were attractive, some of them weren't. <laughs> that didn't matter. I felt, um, I felt home, I felt peace. And it was that same peaceful feeling I had when I prayed in our living room. It was that peace that, it was so reassuring. I wasn't alone. And then uh, later on that day, we, you go through a little series of lectures and conferences and you know I was scared to death to talk to anybody especially on the, air, the elevator right up there were like 50 of us jammed into this little 10 capacity elevator and I 
I remember squeezing my butt cheeks being so afraid. Uh, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> but I distinctly remember walking into the, uh, another portion of the meeting. And as I walked into there, uh, there was a really neat, peaceful, very strong spirit there. And they, it was just a little music piece they were doing. And it, uh, a woman was playing Our Savior's Love on the violin. And uh, I remember the spirit coming and saying, close your eyes, Brett, and just feel. And I closed my eyes and I thought, if the Savior were here, what would he be doing? And uh, in my mind's eye, I saw him and I saw him walk. And he was there with us and he didn't take it away. He didn't heal. He didn't change everybody like I'd always prayed for and hoped for. He was just there and he comforted and he, he understood. And it was, um, it, that, that was the single moment that I changed. That was the moment I decided, well, this is possible then. Up to this, it was, it could be possible. I could maybe do it. I hope it will work. But in that moment, it was, I can do this. I'm not alone. If he intended this, then this means it has purpose in my life. This means that this changes the whole game. And that's exactly what happened from that point on. Um, I took a dramatic turn in my demeanor, in my hope, in what I wanted. Um, that's a whole long story. Uh, in terms of my wife, Megan, she and I have known each other for years and years. Um, we met back when we were 15. Mm -hmm. uh, sh her sister, her older sister is in my mom and dad's board. Her sister had triplets and Megan would come out during the summertime and help with the triplets. And so we were 15 when we met. We met in Sunday school. And I, I distinctly remember meeting Megan. Uh, her red hair and her personality. She makes herself known and heard. And uh, I didn't have any interest in girls at that time. I was only interested in boys. I was curious and I wanted friends and I was you know curious about all these other SSA feelings. But uh, I'll never forget that Sunday meeting Megan there in our church. And uh, we stayed in contact. We stayed good friends. Um, right prior to my mission, we went and played games at her sister's house. And uh, it was always funny hanging out there. I would always get a hard time from her older sister. Um, on my mission, we rode a couple of times, but it wasn't anything uh, romantic, at least not from my end. <laughs> Maybe for Megan, I don't know. <laughs> At any rate, uh, during all this time, coming home and my big long sob story of how hard it was, Megan was always there. We dated for a little couple weeks. I call it dating. She doesn't. Uh, immediately upon getting home, and then she went off to New Zealand, did a study abroad program, and she made it very well known that nothing was going to get in the way of her studying. Um, and... Uh, there was a strong friendship though, and that has always been there. Uh, she came home from New Zealand, she was looking tan and cute, and had all this excitement about where she'd been and what she'd learned, and uh, we dated again, and this time I dumped her. <laughs> Don't get mad, get even. And uh, it, uh, it, it didn't seem to work out in my mind that she and I would get married. I was too fearful of so many different things, of sex primarily, as I mentioned earlier, I was afraid of um, never having what I really wanted, which was a boyfriend, which was having a homosexual relationship. I was too afraid of what the future would hold to move forward into it. And so um, that's why I broke up with her. And I found all kinds of excuses it was easy to do. Not that she's not remarkable, but for me it was easy to justify. Um, I also noticed that as we dated that second time, the closer we got emotionally, the worse my SSA became. My same-sex attraction went through the roof. Um, it was, that was the time, um, that was one of the times that I really started to doubt. And so once we broke up, my SSA diminished. The pressure was gone. And uh, it was still there, but it just wasn't as bad. So a year later, we dated again because I just couldn't get her off my mind. 
um, I knew that I really loved her. I knew that we had something. Um, I especially knew that when she walked into church holding some other guy's hand. <laughs> and that really ticked me off. And I thought, that's not cool. I'm, if anybody's going to marry her, that's going to be me. What is my Megan doing with him? And he's a great guy, no offense to him, but that just wasn't going to be the case. And so we dated again, and the pressure was right back, and the SSA went right through the roof again, of course. And that was when all that turmoil that I described earlier came about. Um, after that first Evergreen conference I went to, I met a whole bunch of guys that have just been a huge blessing to me. Um, both Megan and I have a really strong network of friends in this community um, and outside of the community uh, that have been a huge support, uh, what I would call a non-negotiable support. Uh, this path, this, these feelings weren't created in isolation and they're not going to be healed in isolation. And I realized that all those years of praying and hoping it would just go away and praying that, that it would, that wasn't going to happen. God had a whole different plan for me. And as I put my trust in Him, it's opened up in ways that I could never describe in words. Not just peace anymore, but um, faith and confidence, um, knowing who I am, discovering my own masculinity, discovering parts about myself that I didn't know were there. There's an assertive part of me that came alive through this this self-discovery, recognizing that I'm capable of far more than what I had limited my own mindset to when dating those previous girls, and that my capabilities only expanded when I, I got faithful with my wife, and I trusted her, and I trusted God to do with me more than I can do for myself. Um, that's not been easy, and it's a day-to-day -day thing, but my goodness, it's awesome. Uh, sex is a whole nother video that we'll have to talk about at some other point, but sex is awesome. Uh, it's, it's way better than I ever thought possible, and even that, I've seen miracles, and I've uh, felt joy and connection that I never dreamed was possible with my wife. I thought that was only meant to be in a homosexual relationship, and that's just not true for me. So getting to the point where um, our relationship is at where it's at has been a progressional thing. It's taken time. It's taken taken help. It's taken trust in each other. Uh, we've been in therapy uh, once or twice. We've read books. We talk about everything. If you don't, if you can't talk about it, you can't do it. Is one of our primary rules simply because we uh, we need that foundation of trust and. What that has done is just grown our marriage uh, exponentially. It's really quite remarkable. Um, along this path, uh, what happened was after I got to that point of despair and then going to the conference and getting help that I needed, um, I, you know, Megan and I went on, we got married. I felt confident about... You told me. Yeah, I told her first. That's a good point. Uh, I knew that I had to tell her before I would, we got to a point in our relationship, Megan and I got to a point in our relationship where I knew it couldn't progress any further until she knew the full story. And I knew that she knew something was up with me, but I didn't feel safe to talk to her about it. After gaining some support, friends, telling my parents, I knew that it was time to move on and, and take some risks. And so I did that. I told her. Uh, Megan was awesome. She was unbelievable. I thought that it would end the relationship. I thought that it was over. And I said, you know, at the end of this hour discussion, I had written some stuff down. I'd gotten a few phone numbers from other spouses. And I, I went through my little list of things. Well, I called her up the day before and I said, we need to talk. I've got some really serious stuff I need to tell you, but I need you to have an open heart and an open mind. And I knew she was scared based on her response on the phone call, and I wanted her to be scared. I wanted her to be open to whatever. And that discomfort is maybe you call that rude, I don't care, it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, we met that Saturday night, and um, it was scary as all get out. We, I insisted we say a prayer. 
And then I just went into it. I said, do you know what SSA means? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> uh, well, grab the crayons. I'm going to have to spell it out for you because I can't even say it. Um, and I started to explain what I'd recently been learning and reading about. And she just absorbed all of it. She listened. And she didn't flinch. She didn't act terrified. It was more of a, oh, that's why you've been acting kind of funny. Yeah, that's why I'm a really slow you know, mover in terms of dating. That's why your sister's ticked off at me for not putting the moves on you after our first date. Uh, but she was awesome. And at the end of the whole hour and a half or hour long conversation, after describing some of the causes that I judged were the causes and my experiences, I said, the ball's in your court. And I had anticipated the worst. I had expected that she was gonna dump me. Um, and hoped for the best. And her response, as I said, ball's in your court, so what do you want to do? Uh, how do you want to end this? And she looked at me and she said, are you crazy? <laughs> and I remember thinking, no, that's not what you're supposed to say. And she said, uh, I love you all the same. This is what made you you. This is a part of you. And those words have stuck with me. And uh, I'd never felt that type of reception before from a peer, from a friend, and truthfully, she's the first friend I ever told. Um, those, were, those were difficult and yet faith-filled days for us, for our relationship, for uh, what was being built, and I had no idea how big it was going to get. <laughs> um, no, Megan was very supportive from the get-go. It was all about getting my needs met and supporting me, whether that was attending a weekend or uh, getting guy time, meaning hanging out with some of my friends, if it was uh, attending conferences, being with my brothers, if it was telling a new person, she was always there texting or calling, how did it go, you know, what, how are we gonna handle this? Um, just remarkable. Um, I remember the scariest people to tell it was the rest of my family, especially my brothers. I was most fearful of their responses, my younger brother and my two older brothers. And I told them one at a time. I knew distinctly that I'm not gonna shotgun this. I got a sniper at one at a time. And uh, Megan was great about that. She you know, kind of threw in her two cents of how to best do it. And with one of them, it had to be over dinner. With another one, it had to be on the phone. I couldn't see him face to face. That would be too scary for me. Um, and with my other, my younger brother, that had to be face to face, and each of them were so supportive. Uh, my oldest brother just cried with me. Um, my other brother, uh, Troy, just broke down in tears with me, and my younger brother immediately started joking with me. He said, "I always wondered about you, Pret." <laughs> Um, but the difference that has made finally letting them see all of me, not holding anything back has just been not only exposed, but filled back up, filled up with this confidence and trust. They've become my biggest advocates. They've become my biggest supporters. Their questions are the most deep and the most sincere of anybody's. Um, they've been just remarkable. And uh, it, funny, funny beyond all belief. We joke about it all the time. And whereas what may have been threatening in the past is reassuring now. I remember one time going hunting. My family's always been into hunting and fishing and I always resented it growing up. I always hated it. Um, but after the mission and taking these things on, I thought, let's try something new. Let's do something I haven't done. And uh, I distinctly remember one time uh, we were down south doing some quail hunting and when we do that you go for a week and you stay in these motels and to save money you just pile up into one room and you get two beds and everybody just goes to sleep and you wake up early the next morning you go and shoot some birds and I remember one morning you always pray before you go out nobody needs to get shot over this um, so you say a prayer for safety and at one point we were all circling up to pray and one of the brothers that I'd shared the bed with starts, you know, kind of giggling or laughing right before the prayer. 
And all of us were like, what's so funny? And he says, well, it's the first night I ever slept with a gay man, and, you know, I still have my temple recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it was so funny to me, their humor and their invitation into <coughs> accepting this as just another part of life has just been revitalizing, just very welcoming. So, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. It's been one heck of an adventure. We have a beautiful daughter that I love to death that I never thought was possible, and yet I have hope for a few more children. Not a whole you know, gaggle like I thought before, but definitely a few more. Um, my future in relation to this is unpredictable. I never thought I would do interviews. I never thought I'd come out publicly. I never thought I would be talking about this stuff, and yet I recognize the huge need for openness. I recognize that shame uh, festers and it grows in secrecy. Um, and I've realized that not accepting my whole self, not dealing with this, not being the whole me is cheating other people out of who I am. It cheats the world out of the gifts that I've been given that are uniquely endowed or, or given to me as a person. and. I don't want to, it's almost like you're with somebody who's really, really funny and you know you love being with them because they're just naturally hilarious and you go to hang out with them one night and they're just not funny. You know they're holding back and you know that they're keeping it all in and it's like, come on, get the jokes going. You're so much fun to be with. Let's, let's hear it. And I realized that that's how I've lived my life is holding part of who I am back. And so my future is is awesome. I see myself continuing to develop into my own masculinity. Um, I see my marriage as even more fulfilling um, than it has been, even though it's been remarkable. I see more children in the future. I see those spirits who are waiting to come down to my household. I see myself as a protector, as a father, as somebody committed to providing for them and teaching them the right ways. I see myself um, succeeding, whether it's, uh, you know, further academia stuff, uh, schooling, if it's occupationally, if it's in the church. I see a brighter future than I've ever seen. And ironically, that's through accepting these aspects of myself that I thought were entirely unacceptable. And that was the drive to eradicate them. And yet, endorsing um, these parts of me I grew up hating is exactly my future. That doesn't mean living the gay lifestyle. That means taking the gifts that are in it. That means taking the gold that this is laced with. Uh, Ether 12:27. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And if they humble themselves and have faith in me, you know, I'm just quoting, not verbatim. Um, I'll make their weakness become strengths unto them. The faith in me is the crucial part, the action, the becoming. And I know that God can do that. He's done it with me and he'll continue to do it. Um, I love discovering more of who I am as a person. I love um, those moments, those aha moments of this is part of my intrinsic value. This is part of my masculinity. And this is part of the gift that I can offer other people by being authentic, by being transparent, by being real, uh, by being vulnerable. Um, and that doesn't mean weakness. That's actually a strength. Uh, so my future in relation to this issue and my family is brighter than it's ever been. Um, I feel fulfillment. I feel joy on a daily basis. And if I don't, I recognize why I don't. And I wasn't aware of that before. I felt subject to my emotions. I felt like I was on an inner tube behind the boat being whiplashed around as every turn was taken. And that's no longer the case. Uh, my destiny is my choice. So it's Prett gave the, the background to know each other for about 15 years. I have written in my journal the day that I first saw him. And oh, there's this really cute guy, well, a couple of them, at church. 
But he's the one I picked. There was only and one other one that was cute. But <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we saw each other over the years and had that background. But I, um, I saw the turmoil he was going through during that time. Uh, it was, as he said, apparent to everyone. And I remember calling a friend that had been married for about a year and, and just saying, I know something's going on. What can I do to support support him now? You know, without knowing what it is. And she said, just, just love him. Let me just be there. And um, at that point, you know, living single, I had time on my hands. And, and I tried to regularly go to the temple. And... Um, as he, he told me things later, and we kind of did the math and everything, realized the, the day that he hit his rock bottom, uh, the night before, day before, at some point I had actually started fasting for him and had gone to the temple that morning and was at the temple praying for him when all that was going on. And so I, I know that the Lord has had a hand in, in our lives and, and us coming together from that point that we figured that out. I mean, it was apparent anyway, but... Um, and then down to his phone call of, you know, you need to... We need to talk and it's going to be hard. And again, had the opportunity to go to the temple the night before and I didn't make it into the temple. I don't remember if I was too late or why, but so I spent time just reading my scriptures on on the grounds outside of the temple and and ended up reading that night the eighth or twelve twenty seven and saying, you know, whatever whatever he's gonna say, whoever he is and whatever makes him who he is has made him into the man that I love. And um has made him the, the leader that he is, um, the gentle-hearted man that he is, the great brother, son, friend, you know, whatever, all aspects of his life, whatever it is, is who he is, and that's who I love. And so from there, as he said, him telling me, it was just kind of, okay. <laughs> No, well, where do we go from here? And, and has, as he also said, there's been great support, um, network of support from the very beginning. And, and I am grateful that I have been along the journey with him from the beginning and that I was able to make the choice and to choose him and to and choose all of him knowing what it was going to be and knowing that it wasn't going to be easy and being okay with that. With choosing him and having him choose me, I gotta say I've got double the luck because he chose me out of all of the women and all of the men <laughs> that he could have had. And so um, with that, it, I, I knew where he had come from and, and I had hope in where we would go together and like I said the the journey's been interesting it hasn't been smooth sailing the whole way for sure but I've always been able almost always <laughs> been able to pick out his gold and see see his goodness and I know I probably don't express my gratitude enough to him or to my Heavenly Father for, for the blessing of having him in my life, for the amazing priesthood holder he is, the amazing husband he is, the amazing father that he is. And I'm so grateful that, um, that he had the strength and the testimony um, to do what's been hard for him. And, you know, just the other day we were talking about the sacrifices that, that we've each made in this and, and for the support that we've given each other. And I said, you know, thank you for all your support and, and your time. And I said, well, I know it has good returns. 
you're a good investment. <laughs> and um, but and there have been I've had my hard times too. I've had my moments of of tears and um, and of sadness and of indescribable joy and to know that he's there and he makes the choice to to come home to be with us to be with me I'll second it that sex is great <laughs> our daughter is beautiful mm -hmm. um, and it's worth it it's worth it and I know, I know that we wouldn't be here without the, the Savior, without His atonement, and, you know, not to call you imperfect, but He's not the only one that's imperfect in our relationship either. I brought to the, the relationship my own weaknesses, and they have been compensated for um, by our Savior, and looked beyond by Pret and strengthened through Pret um, to become strengths. One thing we've learned together is that, um, how do I put this, change, change is inevitable. Growth, that's the optional part. And that's something that we've we've learned in our relationship that we have naturally change. Life has a way of impacting us. We, we're human beings, we're subject to all kinds of things around us. And so the change is inevitable. Growth is the optional piece. That's the choice part. And in our marriage together, we've chosen to grow together. And it's a daily choice. It's <coughs> not <coughs> to love somebody. You, love is a choice. It's not the, the the Hollywood, you know, oh, you see her, and then it's all just magical from there on out. It, that's cool. That's just simply not reality. The reality is that you choose, you know, you choose the love of your life, and then you choose that person every single day. And I love my choice. And I'm reminded of that every morning I wake up, I especially love it at night because she scratches my back and I just love it. That's the most comforting thing to me is to lay next to my wife and to just be at peace. And it, I thought back then that, oh, I'll feel like I'm missing out, um, that I won't have this great gorgeous guy or I won't have all those things. I don't feel that in the slightest. I feel gratitude. For our relationship, I feel gratitude for our growth together, um, and it, it's a choice, absolutely. We've both had to put effort into change. He's he's changed. I've changed. I've learned. I've um, grown, mm -hmm. and again, just grateful for the opportunities that this has given us to learn and to grow and just the the strength that we have in our marriage um, comes both from the families that we both came from and learning from the good and the bad that we got from from both of them but just the the effects that this has had on on our families on our friends and for the good as we've shared it with people and and gained their support and been able to give support in return in many ways too has been has been fabulous and to offer that hope to others. One thing I think we both learned is that you you train your support. Support isn't this automatic thing where people just know how to love you and how to listen to you and how to take care of you. You teach people how to support you. You you show them how to love you. You ask I ask for what I need. And that's taken effort in our relationship. It's taken time. And Megan, in how she supports me, has changed. And I've changed in how I support her, and I'm grateful. Um, telling my dad, telling my brothers, telling my friends even. I've had to be very explicit, very direct in what I want, what I need, and what support to me looks like. 
I, I let go of that expectation that people just automatically are going to love me and it's all going to be, you know, hunky-dory. That's not reality either, though I create my realities by asking for what I need. And that's exactly what we've done in our marriage and it's been phenomenal. Mm -hmm.